Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Catherine Corneille, and in name of my colleagues in the Department of Theology and in the Department of Economics, I want to uh, welcome you all to this opening lecture of our symposium on <coughs> religious dialogue and economic development. Um, for the past three years, Boston College has invited religious scholars from different parts of the world to come together to reflect on certain fundamental topics in interreligious dialogue. The first uh, conference took place two years ago in, in 2008, and the focus of that conference was on criteria of discernment in interreligious dialogue. So what are the norms that religions use to judge what is valuable and true in other religious traditions? <coughs> Uh, the second conference took place last year, and the focus of that conference was interreligious hermeneutics. So what are the possibilities and the challenges of mutual understanding between religions, uh, and how uh, do religions interpret one another in order to advance uh, sometimes their own uh, self-understanding. Um, the volumes that uh, were based on those two conferences uh, were published and are available in the back of the room at a conference discount rate of $20. Uh, the conference this year, the focus of the conference this year is on interreligious dialogue and economic development. Um, so what might different uh, religious traditions individually uh, and in dialogue with one another be able to contribute by way of uh, critical reflection or constructive uh, contribution uh, to economic theory. That is the focus of our <coughs> symposium this year. So as you see, we have expanded the dialogue to include not only representatives from different religious traditions, but also uh, economists. And we are very happy uh, to have economists from Boston College, but also from different parts of the world who have come to Boston College to be part of our discussions. Uh, not only to keep theologians grounded in reality, but also to help us gauge, hopefully, what we might contribute as uh, religious thinkers to uh, economic development. Um, so this is the focus of the symposium, which will take place over uh, the next two days. Um, but tonight is our opening lecture uh, on interreligious dialogue and economic development. And uh, the theme of this conference is actually a theme that is very close to the heart of the sponsor of these conferences, Brian O'Brien. And so I have asked Brian to say a few words uh, to welcome us uh, at this conference. I will first briefly uh, introduce Brian. Uh, Brian is a graduate uh, of the Boston College class of 1980. He's uh, chairman and CEO of Advisory Research and founder of Marquette Capital, an investment uh, advisory firm that mer merged with ARI in 1996. A former vice president of Bear Stearns, Brian began his career with Oppenheimer and Company in 1981. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of Boston College and serves on the Investment and Endowment Committee. He also serves on the Board of Trustees and the Executive Committee of the University of Chicago Medi Medical Center. He's a member of the Investment Committee of the University of Chicago Endowment and a trustee of Westminster School in Sinsbury, uh, in Connecticut. Uh, Brian and his wife Mary have three children and Alex is here at Boston College at this time. So it's my pleasure now to give the floor to Brian. Thank you, Catherine. It's always dangerous to give me a microphone in a room full of people, so I wrote my comments tonight to make sure I'm brief. Uh, I'd like to start this evening by saying thank you to our keynote speaker, Professor Paul Knitter, and tonight's respondents, Professors Akers and Kabowski. A special thanks also to Catherine Corneal for the tremendous job she has done organizing this year's symposium and for the last three years of efforts for past symposium and for the three years to come. My name is Brian O'Brien. As Catherine said, I graduated from Boston College with honors in 1980 with dual degrees in finance and theology. My interest in tonight's topic, and for that matter, in the now six-year interreligious dialogue symposium, started during my undergraduate years here at Boston College. While the study of finance was a somewhat precise science of logical outcomes 
measured by probability analysis, my coursework in theology gave me a deeper understanding of not only theology as a field of study, but more importantly for me, an insight into abstract thinking that eventually proved to be the most challenging, and I've got the grades to prove it, part of my education here at Boston College, but also the most beneficial component of my education as well. Upon graduation, I did not have a clear path or goal by any stretch of the imagination. Those of you who are seniors, um, it's really scary to start, but it gets better after you get out. So just <laughs> relax and it'll work out. But one evening with a friend when we were discussing my dual degree in finance and theology, he remarked, I have no idea what you've possibly been trained for with that degree, but you could consider using a dollar bill as your business card given its tagline of, in God we trust. My particular interest in the development of this interreligious symposium at BC originated shortly after the tragedies of 9-11. During the few years following the events of that day, two things became clear to me. First, that we are living in a global economy, and the good and the bad of this economic transition will be widespread. Secondly, that religion and religious conflicts will play an ever-increasing role in the globalization of our world's economies and the citizens of our planet. You don't have to pick up a paper today and look too far into it to see how religion and economics are constantly melding and developing in all aspects of everything we do. But it was out of that thinking that my wife Mary Hass and myself thought maybe, just maybe, a small kernel of light could be shed on this issue through this multi-year symposium here at Boston College. As for tonight's topic, profits and profits, whoever came up with that, that was good by the way. <laughs> um, it is an area that's mixing two delicate subjects and I'm most grateful for the presenters and the respondents this weekend's creative thought and intellectual pursuit to start, start to put some new and unique thinking on the globalization of our world and the fallout and benefit that may accrue to the world's economies and the world's religions. Again, I thank each of tonight's speakers for their time, especially Professor Cornell and her family. Are the kids here tonight, by the way? No. You didn't get them <laughs> twice? All right. But they, the whole family's been involved in this project from what I gather, so days and weeks and months on end as she's worked on this. So give them a special thanks, will you? Thank you. Um, for the many hours and efforts that have been invested in this. Thank you very much. I'm just thrilled to be here and wonderful, wonderful to see the number of people here at BC that have shown up for this, th this evening and future years and for the past years. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the main speaker for this evening, Paul Nitter. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with him and with his work. Uh, Paul Nitter is now the Paul Tillich Professor of Theology, World Religions and Culture at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Previously, he taught for some 30 years at Xavier University in Cincinnati. He received a licentiate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Uh, a doctorate from the University of Marburg in Germany. Uh, most of his publications have dealt with the religious pluralism and interreligious dialogue. Since his groundbreaking 1985 book, No Other Name, he has been exploring how the religious communities of the world can cooperate in promoting human and ecological well-being. From 1986 to 2004, Nitter was on the board of directors of CRISPAS, Christians for Peace in El Salvador. He's also on the board of trustees for the International Interreligious Peace Council. Paul has indeed played a pivotal role in shifting the focus of the dialogue between religions from purely theoretical and theological issues to more ethical, ecological, and economical issues, ceaselessly calling attention to dialogue circles to the plight of the poor and the marginalized. We are therefore very happy that Paul has accepted our invitation to speak to uh, us this evening, and please w help me welcome uh, Paul. Thank you, Catherine. 
Uh, it's, I'm very happy to be here, uh, not just because we're going to be talking about a very important topic. Whoops, let me see. I'll cancel that, and we should go back. There we go. Um, but also because it's a, a chance for me to just to meet a lot of old friends, including old, uh, not real old students, but students from Xavier who are now professors in, in the area here, and uh, as well as for my wife Kathy and I to be, uh, to be with our, uh, our Buddhist teacher, uh, Lama Professor John McCransky, who's teaching tonight, couldn't be here. So it's just for so many reasons, I was just delighted to be here. Um, as we walked out the, uh, the door this morning to catch the, uh, the train to Boston, I was going to put on my, um, my Yankee hat. Um, and Kathy said, you better not do that. Uh, <laughs> You're, you're, you know where you're going, and uh, I, I mentioned it to Michael, our technician here, who set things up, and he says, yeah, it's a good thing you didn't. He says, you might have developed problems with your PowerPoint. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway, uh, good to be here. Um, the topic, this is interesting, profits and profits. Um, on my title, on my paper, I have, that's it. Look at your programs. Which comes first? <laughs> um, is there something to be? <laughs> we'll talk about that. OK. Well, you know, I think if Catherine Cornell would have assigned this, the topic of this paper to a modern day Tertullian, he might have revised his famous, uh, theologians know this, quid ergo Atenis et Hierosolimus, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem, and he might have changed it and quipped, what has New York, Wall Street, to do with Jerusalem, the religious Main Street? What have economics and economic development to do with religion and interreligious dialogue? Well, my cutesy title, Prophets and Prophets, is meant to convey a very clear answer to Tertullian a lot. Jerusalem and New York, or London, or, or Beijing, have much to say to each other. In what follows, I would like to make the case that the nature and present state of the global economic system, as well as the nature and present state of the world's religious communities, need to, and are very able to, to engage each other. We need dialogue between prophets and prophets. Now, I'd like to make my case in f five steps. Just to, first, I just want to uh, very briefly go over something that perhaps a number of you are already familiar with and agree with, that the modern um, neoliberal market economy can be considered a religion. Secondly, that it's a religion that, like all religions, has to dialogue with other religions. It's in need. The economy as a religion is in need of dialogue with others. Thirdly, and I'm going to kind of skip this one for purposes of time, that this new situation in which the religions are called to dialogue with, with uh, the economic reality is providing the religions with a new context, a new, a new uh, framework or arena in which to carry on a very different kind of dialogue. Fourthly, and this is the, the, the core part, I think, in their dialogue with the market, I want to show what the religious prophets have to say to the market profiteers. Um, what is the content of what the religions have to say? And I'm going to end with some practical suggestions. So um, starting, um, actually, I just went right through this. So I'm going to move right on to this. The neoliberal market um, economy is a religion among religions. You know, today we, we very uh, um, and uh, very easily talk about. We just heard it about the the global economy. Um, we speak about a global economy, um, but we don't talk about a global religion. There are many religions, but none of them are global. None of them dominate all over over all the others. Although <laughs> maybe some of them would like to do just that. Um, but we do talk, even though there are different economic systems, there is only one that is dominant today. For all practical purposes and sundry outcomes, there is one global economic system, and that's the economic system 
that I want to bring into dialogue with the religions. As powerful and dominant as it is, it's, it, this, this economic system is a slippery beast that can be referred to by a variety of terms. Um, new classical economics, the free market economy, rational and efficient market, general equilibrium theory, uh, or there are some more mm, somewhat negative descriptives, a market fundamentalism, economism, John Cobb likes that one, utopian economics, John Cassidy, or the disdainful casino capitalism. The name I will be using throughout these reflections tonight will be the neoliberal market economy. And with it I refer broadly, I, ho I hope not too broadly, to the understanding of the market that I think, and we've got two economists will, that'll tell me if I'm right on this, the, the understanding of the market that has been taught in American universities and followed in the global market since, since the late 70s. Essentially, it asserts that the market can best function when it is given free range, when it is left to itself and to its own inner dynamic with a minimum of outside, especially governmental, interference. Now, clearly, after the financial chaos that has descended on Wall Street and on the world as of 2008, the minimal interference is being questioned today. Thank heavens. But not so it seems, at least to me, in a way that questions the fundamental capitalist structures and the necessary free processes of the market. So it's this market, this market that I want to, um, whoops, let me just go back here. It's this market that I want to uh, claim is and functions like a religion. And here I'm quoting one of the, uh, does it get, oops, I guess it's, no, you know what, I think it's not quite, you know what I'm going to do? I think the, we, I'm just going to go out of this and go into a different uh, slideshow presentation and just go right ahead to where we were. Um, here. We have it all, no, we don't. Oh, well, I don't know, Michael, if it's worthwhile to, do you want to, Anyway, this is a statement of David Loy, one of, the, one of the participants in our conference today, that religion is notoriously difficult to define. I'll read it. If, however, we adopt a functionalist view and understand religion a in a functionalist view as what grounds us by teaching us what the world is and what our role in the world is, then, then our present economic system should also be understood as our religion because it has come to fulfill a religious function for us. Um, I, we, can dis, we can discuss that. David Loy, L-O-Y. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, if you want to just fiddle with it while I talk, um, go, go right ahead. Um, this is the point that the, that the market, I mean, it doesn't call itself a religion, and certainly I don't want to accuse economists of being anonymous uh, religionists, uh, um, but, um, but you guys do sometimes, well, okay. Um, I quote John Cassidy, the free market isn't merely an economic wonder, it is a godlike contraption that takes individual acts of egocentricity and somehow, there's that miraculous transcendent part, somehow transforms them into socially beneficial outcomes. The fuel that keeps the mechanism of the free market humming is human selfishness. Utopian economics, the neoliberal market system that we're talking about, goes beyond the scientific doctrine. John Cassidy says it is a political, not a, it is a political philosophy or a secular faith. Now this is, we could talk about that, and I hope we, we, we will in, in terms of our conference and maybe a little bit tonight when, in the responses from the, from the economists, um, from Joe and Jenny. But this is now the, the, uh, the religion, the market as a religion that I want to say that it is in need of dialogue with other religions. And the one reason why I'm making that claim is simply because 
The neoliberal market economy, it seems to many of us, is a religion that isn't working. It's not achieving the ends that I think it itself holds up for itself. Now, at this point, I'm stepping beyond my professional competence. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to offer a general assessment of the state of the, of the economy as a layperson, a non-economist. And here I'm, I'm exposing myself to the, to the, um, the accusations that many of us theologians hear every time we start talking about economic matters. You religious types, not every time, frequently. You, you, you religious types don't know what you're talking about in your proclamations about the economy. Now, I'm sure that is often, very often, the case. But it doesn't have to be the case. And I hope, I hope it won't be the case tonight. Analyses and criticisms of the economy cannot be reserved to economists and businessmen or business leaders. That would be something like, I'm at a Catholic university, so I can make this comparison. Uh, and I am a Catholic, uh, that, w that would be something like the claim that you have to be a pope or a bishop to know what the Catholic Church really believes. That is patently not the case, uh, often, uh, I, I think. That's another topic, but we're not going to talk about that one tonight. Um, so um, my description of the state of the economy consists in what I think are three undeniables. Okay, now I hope I hope we can have some basic agreement on these three undeniables. The suffering billions, secondly, the endangered planet, and thirdly, the handicapped invisible hand. So let me start out the suffering billions. If one of the central purposes of the market system is to organize and facilitate the production and exchange of goods and services so that, thank you, Michael, so that the basic human needs of all can be met and general well-being fostered, I hope you agree on that, then it is quite evident, it seems to me, that our present neoliberal market economy isn't measuring up to its own self-assigned task. The assertion can be advanced under this, this what I'm just said, can be advanced under two, two perspectives. Um, justice is not being served, that's one. The other, suffering, suffering is not being addressed. I prefer the latter. It's a lot more difficult to argue about suffering than it is about justice. While the question, who's justice, very famous book, may perplex and lead to extended scholarly dis discussion, the question, who's suffering, is aroused by simply looking around. And while justice may call for deliberation, suffering calls for response. So I want to start my commentary on the state of the economy with the reality of human suffering, the kind of suffering that human beings feel when they cannot feed or provide shelter for or medicine or education for their children, the kind of suffering that prevents living and fosters dying. I'm speaking about the kind of suffering that evokes in any, I think, in any or most feeling human beings, not, darn it, I want to say, in all feeling human beings, what Ed Edward Skillebex calls a negative experience of contrast, namely something which, when we see it or hear it or understand it, it arouses immediately in us a negative emotion. This should not be. This should not exist. This is not right. That's what I want to talk about. And yet to adequately understand and feel such suffering, I don't want to look at it by itself. Now here, I don't want to look at suffering by itself. What I want to focus on tonight with you is not simply the reality that, as Jeffrey Sachs starkly states it, I'm quoting Jeffrey Sachs, Currently, more than 8 million people around the world die each year because they are too poor to stay alive. Or as Fray Beto reminds us, more than 3 billion people, almost half the world's population, live below the poverty line. And that 1.3 of them live below the total despair line. 
I want us to face and feel the fact that these billions of human beings suffer from dehumanizing need alongside others who have incredibly more than what they need. That's the point I want to make. The starved live and die alongside the stuffed. Islands of opulence exist in oceans of poverty. While we may argue about whether the global market has increased or diminished global poverty, that's a question we, we have to investigate, or whether the tide that has raised the yachts of the wealthy will eventually raise or capsize the boats of the poor, I don't think there can be much argument that over the past 40 years, the distance between lavish wealth and grinding poverty has broadened. After World War II and into the early 70s, in most developed countries, including our own, this one, there seems to have been an intolerance of excessive economic inequality. That has changed. I quote the recently deceased Tony Judd. Over the past 30 years, we have thrown all of that away. All around us, this is Tony Judd, even in a recession, we see a level of individual wealth unequaled since the early years of the 20th century. The wealthy, like the poor, have always been with us, but relative to everyone else, they are today wealthier and more conspicuous than at any time in living memory. End of quote. So, as reported by the, by, uh, by the Bill Moyers Journal, a recent study of the Wall Street Journal found that the top 1%, or 14,000 American families, hold 22.2% of the wealth, while the bottom 90%, over 133 million families, can claim only 4% of America's wealth. Certainly, such glaring disparity in the sharing of the goods of this earth will stir up cries of injustice. And I join those cries. But what I want to keep the focus on tonight is on the suffering, on what are called the path pathologies of inequality. That's Tony Judd's expression, the pathologies of inequality. I, I just have a few graphs that let me show you that that, that line up industrialized nations in the following four graphs. They line up industrialized nations in Europe, North America, and Asia along the spectrum of greater or lesser economic equality and show clearly that the greater the discrepancy in wealth, the higher the rate of crime and of physical and mental illness, and the lower the rate of social mobility and life expectancy. On each of these graphs, notice the United States is the winner, the winner in both inequality and in pathology. Let me just go ahead here. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to try it this way now, see if I can, if this will work. Okay, I'm just going to bear with me. Here we go. This is on income inequality, higher on the right side. Um, and um, homicides per million. You see the United States way up there, uh, out of the pack. Another, another. This, this one on income inequality on the bottom, low to high, and the the index of health and social problems. So the higher the higher the inequality, the higher the worse the, the health and social problems. These are all taken from Tony Judd's book. Um, inequality and mental illness. The more th there is of, of, of economic inequality, the higher the mental, everybody's hurting, not just the poor. And, and, and I think here, here we can say, here we can say um, with, with um, with Tony, Tony Jutt, um, that he draws the evident but generally ignored conclusion. Now, would you agree with this? I quote Tony Judd again, inequality then is not just unattractive in itself, it clearly corresponds to pathological social problems. What matters is not how affluent a country is,
but how unequal it is. Now, therefore, I think if we allow, we, especially in the United States, the winner on, on, on all these graphs, um, I, 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 I think what can, what can happen um, in, in, in not facing these situations is what Robert Reich points out, in, you know, in, who has an insider's view as former labor secretary under Clinton. I quote him, if nothing is done, America's three-decade-long lurch towards widening economic inequality is an open invitation to a future demagogue who misconnects the dots, blames immigrants, blames the poor, blames government, blames foreign nations, blames socialists and intellectual elites for the growing, frust growing frustrations of the middle class. Behold, I give you the Tea Party. Behold, I, I give you, I give you recent, I give you recent uh, legislation in Arizona. It's happening, and so I do not believe that that Jutt is in any way exaggerating when he admonishes. This is this is really a powerful statement. I quote him: "Of all the competing and only partial, re partially reconcilable ends that we might seek." the reduction of inequality must come first. Under conditions of endemic inequality, all other desirable goals become hard to achieve. Unequal access to resources of every sort, from rights to water, is the starting point of any truly progressive critique of the world. Reducing inequality is the starting point of any truly progressive critique of the world. Can the neoliberal market economy do that? Reduce inequality? I think so, but it's going to need a lot of help. Why, therefore, the need for dialogue. Secondly, our endangered planet. This one, I think, is even more undeniable than the, the suffering billions. And here, and, and I'll do this briefly, let me just read you a paragraph from Bill McKibben's uh, recent book. He writes, for most of human history, the two birds, more and better, roosted on the same branch. Two birds, one called more, one called better, roosted on the same branch. You could toss one stone and hope to hit them both. Sorry about the violence there towards animals. Um, but that's Bill McKibben. Um, that's why the centuries since Adam Smith have been devoted to the dogged pursuit of maximum economic production. But the distinguishing feature of our moment is this. The bird better has flown a few trees over to make her rest. That changes everything. Now, if you've got the stone of your own life, of your own society gripped in your hand, you have to choose between them. It's more or better. Close quote. If we choose more, we will certainly lose better, or we will destroy the whole forest that sustains them both. And this is where Herman Daly assesses the situation, I think, very accurately. The so-called economic, I'm quoting Herman Daly now, the so-called economic growth Oh, excuse me, so-called economic growth has already become uneconomic. The quantitative expansion of the economic subsystem increases environmental and social costs faster than production benefits, making us poorer, not richer, at least, at least in the high consumption benefit. Countries. I mean, this, here we're talking about so-called developed countries. So the religion of the free market is being called upon to reassess and to reinterpret its traditional doctrines and norms because the birds have flown apart. Daly suggests what we theologians would call a capitalist doctrinal development. Can the growth-based economy become a steady state economy? Now that's a question economists have to, have to answer with the help of others. 
But this is what, how Daly understands it. Let me, the, this is again, Herman Daly. The closer the economy approaches the scale of the whole earth, that's where we're at right now, the closer the economy approaches the scale of the whole earth, the more it will have to conform to the physical behavior mode of the earth. That behavior mode is a steady state, a system that permits qualitative development but not aggregate quantitative growth. Growth is more, growth is more of the same stuff. Development is the same amount of better stuff, or at least different stuff. Clearly, Daly continues, the economy must conform to the rules of a steady state. Seek qualitative development, but stop aggregate quantitative growth. Is that possible in this economic system? It's a question we have to face. And if, it, and if this system can't do it, are there other systems? Finally, the handicapped invisible hand. <laughs> this one's, uh, I think, kind of a no-brainer, if I may say so, as a non-economist. Um, since the chaos and crisis that exploded on Wall Street in 2008 and flowed into the highways and byways of the global economy, there is abundant empirical evidence for the claim I want to put on the table here. Putting it somewhat tritely, the invisible hand that the neoliberal economic doctrine has explicitly or implicitly invoked and trusted and practiced over the past 40 years has proven itself to be handicapped. And I, in the original paper, I give a number of, of reasons why that's claimed, but I think they're generally known. Um, but I think John Cassidy um, summarizes it stingingly. I quote him, the notion of financial markets as rational and self-correcting mechanisms is an invention of the past 40 years. Invention especially created by certain schools of economics that have dominated. Um, arguments about abound about whether we could have and should have or actually did see and then ignored the economic tsunami that first started to sweep the Wall Street shores in 2007. But looking back at what did happen, what has happened, what is still, what, what, uh, of which we're still suffering the effects, we can clearly draw the conclusion, at least I think we can, we'll hear from the economists, that the neoliberal market economy, as it was theorized and taught and is being taught perhaps, I don't know, here in, the, in, 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 in universities, and especially as it was practiced, broke down catastrophically. Um, and here, Fra, uh, Fray Betty says, the invisible hand was amputated by the financial crisis. That's a quotation, maybe too strong. Joseph Stiglitz is perhaps even more caustic with his announcement that the financial collapse we have experienced has, quote, made hash of the economic theories and policies of Friedman and Greenspan. That's a quotation, so I'm not, I'm not attacking. Made hash. And maybe Green, uh, Greenspan admitted that a little bit. So anyway, here, therefore, therefore, however we assess the degree to which our present neoliberal market economy has broken down, whether we believe that the invisible hand has been amputated and must be replaced or broken and can be fixed or handicapped and in need of external help, I trust, I think, I suggest that we can all agree that our present economic system within this country and around the globe is in clear and profound need of reform. If you allow me, what has been said of the Christian church applies just as much and urgently at the moment to the economy. Economia sempre reformanda. The economy is in, always in need of reformation at some periods in history more than in others. Um, the third point, um, I'm, I'm going to, to skip because of time limitations, but this was just to, 
to, to argue, to, to show you why I think that the new call for a dialogue with, the, with, the, with economics and the economy um, to all religions is providing the religions with a new kind of opportunity for dialogue. But I tried to trace that out in a book I did some years back on One Earth, Many Religions. And we'll just move, on, move, move, move beyond that. Now I want to come to what religious prophets have to say to market prophets. Um, and here, um, that, that's the question that, of course, we're going to be exploring in our conference for the next two days. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I want to say now, what do the religions have to contribute? And this isn't easy. Because as the postmodernists remind us, you can't say anything general or universal or make any meta narrative claims about the religions. Hell, I'm going to do it. Uh, 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 and, and I know I'm throwing caution to the wind here, but um, um, I, it's a safe environment. Um, here are three things that I think most religion, no, just about all the religions, or Many people in all the religions, how's that? Many people in all the can agree on. First of all, the, the common themes. That we human beings are not um, homines economici. We are not homo economicus. We're not economical beings. The religions would, would prefer the, the term empathetic beings. Um, I don't want to make too much of the straw man, uh, this, this homo economicus. It's talked about a lot. Um, but boy, this homo economicus, this economic, it sure does seem to me to be the singular incarnation of the capitalist logos. Theologians, logos, incarnation in Jesus. The logos, the capitalist logos is incarnated in the, in the economic man. The product and patron of the free market system is a human being understood as genetically disposed or determined to seek and satisfy one's own interest and to do that before all other interests. Or as, as, uh, as Amatya Sen put it more concisely, I quote him, the assumption of the completely egoistic human being has come to dominate much of mainstream economic theory. That's Sen. How does that square with the anthropology of the religions? I think the two are pretty much diametrically or at least broadly opposed. In a variety of symbols and with different emphases, all the religious traditions tell humanity, paradoxically but promisingly, that self-interest equals, equals other interests. In the ideals of their teachings, though often in the, in, in, not in the reality of their actions, the wisdom traditions, the religions of humankind, call human beings to realize a, uh, a life-giving and a peace-giving co-inherence of self-interest and other interest. We receive our being, according to the religions, from the other. And we maintain our being only in, as it were, really giving it back to the other. Thus we can say homo religiosus, the, the religious human being as a religious being or understood by the religions, is homo empatheticus, the empathetic being, the relational being. being. So the capitalist axiom, now let me just try to get this more clearly so it's not too philosophically. The capitalist axiom, if we seek our own interest, we will also promote the, the interest of others, the way Adam Smith has been understood. The religious communities respond, but if you are not also seeking the interest of others, you will not succeed in achieving your own. The religious prophets, I suggest, are telling the seekers of market prophets that there cannot be any prioritizing. Paradoxically, both self-interest and other interests come first. They both come first. To put one first, as contemporary capitalism seems to do, is to court catastrophe or a breakdown 
of the entire system. The second common theme, and I'm, I'm just going to, I won't go into this, I see time moving rather quickly. The religions would say that ethics, moral values, cannot be externalities to the, to the economic system. Ethical values have to be built into the economic system. They have to be part of it. When I showed my paper to some of my colleagues at, at Union Theological Seminary, you know, seedbed of liberal thinking, um, they said, that's impossible. The, mark, the free market cannot be the moral market. It's just a contradiction in terms. Now, I don't know about that. I hope we can talk about it. But um, this is what I think needs to be done, that, that morality has to be introduced into the very functioning and self-understanding rules, laws of the economic system. And finally, common themes, the religions, I'm going to put it this way, vote for a democratic economy. Um, if I have kind of um, thrown caution to the wind, um, uh, uh, what I've said before, now I'm going to be spitting into the wind and making this claim. But um, I would suggest that it, if we could imagine an interreligious political party, oh, oh hala, um, and if that party were to elaborate an interreligious platform for economic policy, such a policy would be much more democratic than anything we can presently find in the Republican or the Democrat Party. It would be an economy, an economic vision, that injects into every aspect of economic theory and practice a pervasive concern for democratia, literally, people power. Demu kratos, the power of people or in a less confrontational and more accurate free translation, shared power. If the anthropology found in most religions leans towards what we called homo empatheticus, relational being, rather than economic being, if, in other words, religions in various manners affirm both the sanctity of the individual and the dangers of the individual, both the necessity of affirming the rights of individuals within the community, as well as the necessity of limiting the power of individuals over the community, then the religions are implicitly, but clearly it seems to me, endorsing an economic system that can best be described as democratic. It will be a system that in order to promote the economic well-being of all, will solicitous, solicitously guard against the concentration of economic power in the hands of a few. Or more positively, an, economic, an economy inspired by the religious values of mutuality and compassion will share not just love, but power. Not just charity, but opportunity. So, this is all rather general. To give it more body and feel, let me propose that what I am calling a democratic economy would be fittingly embodied in what is being advanced from various quarters today, not just today, but especially today, as economic democracy. It's not socialism. It's not capitalism. It's economic democracy. As such proposals are coming from different quarters and in a variety of shapes and structures. All of them, and, and among the, the ones that I've learned most from is from my colleague and friend at Union Theological Seminary, Gary Dorian, whose book should be out, in, his new book out in two weeks on, on the economy and social ethics, and he has a chapter on, on uh, economic democracy. All of these appraisals intend to, uh, 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 these visions intend a reappraisal and a restructuring of the divisions between the owners of the means of production, and the producers or workers themselves. Again, I'm going to skip over some of the concrete proposals that I find. Uh, uh, in, there's two br broad ways of doing this, kind of the more, the more cooperative system of Madrigal in Spain, 
and then the, the, the programs of supervisory boards uh, and work councils as they're practiced in Europe where workers have a voice on boards, where workers are actually involved in the management. Um, while I strongly believe that religious profits in their dialogue with mar market profits will all favor this economic democracy, um, it, 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 what shape it will take, we don't know. And the religion certainly can't tell. I mean, they don't have the wisdom. That's the work of, economic, of economists. That's the work of social analysis and politicians. But, and, it's, and I hope we don't get stuck in this, well, is it going to be socialism or capitalism? We're, we're looking for different models. Models that are genuinely, we have a, we have a political democracy, I guess. Um, we don't have an economic democracy, clearly. So, uh, okay, I got five more minutes. Um, but here, um, what I want us to try to do now is give you, while I, I gave you three things that I think the religions would agree on, now I want to give you the distinctive voices that come from the various traditions. The, the, what, what these individual traditions can contribute to our, to our dialogue, and we're going to be hearing a lot in the papers that have been, that have been written. Um, but um, one, from the monotheistic, you know what, I'm just going to go through these rather quickly because um, it's just about time. Um, and so I'm, I won't look at my text, I'll just look at what... The monotheistic Abrahamic traditions say, tell us there will be no economic flourishing without justice for everyone. The monotheistic religions believe it's not just these, and I'm talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They do not just believe in a God who is one. They all believe in a God who calls for justice, a God who is just. And, and for all of them, they're saying, unless there is justice, if you want peace, work for justice. That's the main theme. We could, I, we could talk about it more, but that, the Indic traditions, here especially Hinduism and Buddhism, will say, wait, yes, but there will be no economic flourishing without inner peace and compassion that comes from the heart, without internal transformation. So, this is Buddhism and Hinduism. I must admit I'm more influenced by Buddhism. Um, but here they would say, if the, if the Jews and Christians and Muslims are saying, no peace without justice, the Buddhists and the, and, and, and the Hindus would say, hey, but if you, want, if you want justice, you better work for peace. You better work for peace in your own heart. Thich Nhat Hans, in order to make peace, you have to be peace. They are not contradictory, but they're, 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 they're different. The Chinese traditions, Taoism and Confucianism, especially Taoism, but also Confucianism, I don't have time to make that argument here, there will be no economic flourishing without a constant balancing of differences. These, this is the Chinese. They're, they're differences, head-banging differences are just part of the world we live in. And the idea is to honor the differences, but to bring them into balance. Um, and their stress would be then, you've got to balance peace and justice. Both, again, neither can come first. If you want just peace, work for justice. If you want justice, work for peace. Constantly, it's the circle, the yin-yang. As you work for one, if you go too far in one, you've got to start moving towards the other. So that's that balancing of justice, and finally, the indigenous traditions, there will be no economic flourishing without the flourishing of the earth and all its creatures. So that it's not just peace and justice, internal peace, structural justice, but it's also the integrity of creation. This is an essential, and from particularly the, the indigenous religions. Well, let me end with the last part is, so I'm proposing, as we all are, a, a greater dialogue between the religions and the, and, and, uh, the economists and, and um, business persons, but it's not taking place. Um, it, it's not, I mean, we don't have enough of it, to, to say the least. So what I'm, I'm suggesting here is that um, 
we need efforts both to gather multi-faith prophetic voices from the top down, and then I'm going to say from the bottom up. And from the top down, all, I mean, there are, we, we need conferences like this. But what I would like to suggest, can I, just five more minutes. Um, what I'd like to suggest is something along, I mean, first of all, I, what, Brian, what, what you've made possible here at BC with this series, and particularly this one, is exactly the kind of thing we need. Um, to get, to get um, economists, to get business people, to get practitioners t talking with religious, religious so-called leaders and act religious activists. Um, but there is, I'd like to refer to another university here in the Boston area that has given us perhaps an even greater example. I'm referring to what Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm did in the Harvard series on religion and ecology. In a string of 10 very well-planned and well-financed conferences between 1996 and 1998, they gathered broadly recognized scholars from almost all the religions of the world. Each of the conferences focused on what this religion has to contribute to, to resolving our economic crisis. They were all gathered together, came out in a series. You're, I'm sure you're, you're, you're acquainted with these, with, with these series of books. They're using them now. In, in college courses throughout the world. I'm using them now in a course I'm teaching at Union this semester on interreligious dialogue and, and the eco ecology. My urgent recommendation is that a university with such a vision of social justice find some wealthy benefactors who are committed to social justice and institute a similar series on the religions and the economy. I, I guess, given the focus, you have to find a university that is concerned with social justice. You have to find a university that has some friends among the well-to-do. It might be a Jesuit university. Um, so um, from the top down, and there are other things that can be said, but let me finish with also the need, uh, the need for gathering prophetic voices from the bottom up. And here... Um, I'm suggesting the formation of grassroots, multi-religious communities, GMCs. Um, but these would be modeled after the comunidades de base in, in, in Latin American liberation communities. These would be communities of people who, who meet two requirements. They belong to a religious con uh, tradition and they're concerned, because of their religious beliefs, about injustice and the economic situation. Bring these people together on the grassroots level. Let them talk with each other. Let them invite people into their conversation. Um, other economists, I think these kind of grassroots communities of people who come together, first of all, because they're concerned about what a mess the world, their, neighbor, what the, their neighborhoods are in because of drugs, because of, of, of the number of, 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 of single mothers. Uh, 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 but they want to solve problems together and their religions, impel, they come together. They talk together. They form religious communities of action and then they reflect. I think here we do have promise and some of these are, are, are starting to take shape. I, I would even refer to to recent efforts on the part of the White House. Now, you've got to be careful when you're, when you're cooperating with power like that. But the White House Office on, what is, the White House Office on Community, Neighborhood and Interreligious uh, Cooperation are calling religious communities together to, to work on the grassroots neighborhood context precisely on, ec on issues of economic injustice. That's how they phrase it. And one of the clearest examples is Ibo Patel and what he's doing with the Interfaith Youth Corps, bringing these to, So I think things like this can, can happen. So I do believe that the captains of, of economic profit, working, whether working or teaching in New York, London, Tokyo, or Seoul, and the prophets of religion, whether in Jerusalem or Rome or Jakarta or Kyoto, do have much to say to each other. And it is urgent that they do so. My hope is that is that many do or will share this conviction that the dialogue of religions can make an important, if not necessary, contribution, both in theory and in practice, to economic development. 
Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you've really lived up to your own role as a prophet in the discussion on uh, interreligious dialogue. Um, our speakers, our respondents tonight are both economists, as we uh, have mentioned already a few times. Uh, I will first give the floor to Jenny Aker, who is an assistant professor of economics at the Fletcher School and Department of Economics at Tufts University. After working for Catholic Relief Service as Deputy Regional Director in West and Central Africa between 1998 and 2003, Jenny returned to complete her PhD in Agricultural Economics at the University of California in Berkeley. She works on economic development in Africa with a primary focus on the impact of information and information technology on the development outcomes, particularly in the area of agriculture, agricultural marketing, and education. Uh, she also works on the relationship between the shocks and agricultural food market performance, the determinants of agricultural technology adoption, and impact evaluations of uh, NGO and World Bank projects. She has conducted field work in many countries in West and Central Africa, including Benin, Burkina Faso, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gambia, Ghana, Liberia, Mali, Mozambique, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and Sudan. Are there any countries left? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you were going to read that. So. <laughs> <laughs> as well as Haiti and Guatemala. So please join me in welcoming uh, Jenny Aker. So I'm doing something quite strange for an economist, which is I'm not going to show you any data, any graphs, or any specific types of uh, kind of hard, hard, hard uh, PowerPoint projections. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's really quite an honor, and I've enjoyed reading this paper. And, and, I, and I have a confession to make, which is I think you know that I'm neither a religious prophet nor am I someone who is responsible for market profits. Uh, my religious experience basically came from attending church and living and working for Catholic Relief Services in West and Central Africa for many years. And I have a confession to make, which is that I'm not Catholic. Um, my initiation to the principles of the Catholic Church involved an orientation at CRS's headquarters, reading Catholics for Dummies, which exists, in case you think that I'm joking, and mistakenly calling an archbishop and priest the first time I met the Catholic Church in Mali. Now, in my defense, I was speaking in French, and priest was much easier to say than archbishop, but that did not go over very well. I quickly learned about the structure of the church. Now, this certainly doesn't qualify me to talk about any, on behalf of any religion, but I think that these experiences, at least living and working with communities in West Africa, learning about and understanding principles of Catholicism, working with and among different religions to achieve a common purpose, understanding what development means in practice to a variety of different communities, and learning how many actors are actually involved in the development process, from governments to village chiefs to priests, imams, Households, individuals, traders, farmers, firms. I think that this has given me at least some insight into development, religion, and economics, and hopefully the intersection between, the, between all of them. To be begin this dialogue over the course of the next few days, I'd like to propose that we have at least two things. The first thing is, is I think that we need to be on the same page. I don't think that we need to be in agreement. We don't need to be in the same level of understanding in terms of theology or development or economics. But I would at least like to have us to have the same understanding of some of the concepts and the principles that we're using. Secondly, I'd like us to recognize here throughout our discussions how complex development really is. Not only the definition of development and what that means, but also the fact that it needs to be very local and context specific. So I'd like to kind of start briefly with four points and then close, uh, and I don't have too much time. But, but I would argue that if you kind of look closely, the free market religion and the other religions aren't really so par far apart. Professor Nitter asked the question, can the free market alone end inequality? And the answer is a resounding no. Does this mean that the free market religion has failed? And here I would answer that the, the answer is also a resounding no. Because the free market, or what we might call a market without intervention, never pretended to solve inequality. What economic theory does say is that if we make a whole bunch of assumptions, that the market is competitive, that everyone has the same information, that there are no externalities and no public goods, 
then we will end up reaching a competitive equilibrium which will be efficient. Now notice here that I use the word efficient, not equitable or equal. Efficiency says that if you move away from an equilibrium, then you can't make someone else better off without making someone else worse off. Efficiency maximizes the size of the pie, whereas equity decides who gets how much of the pie. And I think that, that the distinction is very important because I would argue that many economists in economic theory fully recognize that efficiency isn't the same as equity. And that efficiency might not and probably is not the ultimate goal for any society. As we said, the monotheistic Abrahamic tradition states that there is no economic flourishing without justice for all. And, and I would think that many economists wouldn't disagree with this. There's a kind of a long history in development economics of looking at how economic growth affects poverty in countries that have extreme inequality. And what they find is that economic growth doesn't necessarily reduce poverty when there is such high inequality. Those same economists often realize that when such a situation exists, when there is such high inequality, then a free market alone will not solve the situation, and consequently, interventions are needed. Now, the type of intervention, however, is really under debate and depends upon who is poor, the degree of poverty, and the causes of poverty, which brings me, I think, to my second point, which is that I would like us to at least discuss the fact that free markets aren't always bad and interventionist markets aren't always good. So I'm going to make an argument here, which is that you know, if we truly hope to have an interreligious dialogue on economic development, I think we have to be a bit agnostic about economics. Now, what do I mean by that? First and foremost, I don't think that it's helpful for us to demonize all free markets and herald all interventionist markets, because there really is no one market. Markets are global and local, they're product and service specific, and they're very complex. And second, because if we truly seek economic development, then we have to be willing to admit that sometimes the free market is the best approach and sometimes they aren't. It really depends upon the country, the context, the group, and the causes of poverty. So let me take a, like a very specific example of this, which is agricultural policies in the US and Europe. We know that our government provides subsidies to farmers, which increase US, increases US production and supply on the world market, decreases world market prices, and we could argue that's going to lower prices in developing countries, and hence potentially impoverishing poor farmers. This seems pretty bad. Scarce resources are being used to support rich farmers in rich countries. Now, there's a lot of things that we could talk about this, but let's just assume right now that that's bad. So what can we do? We could ask the U.S. to remove those subsidies, which is going to reduce U.S. supply, reduce supply in the world market, increase world prices, and then poor farmers in a place such as Mali should be richer which seems great. Well, Malian farmers might be richer, but what about urban Malian rice consumers who are living in the capital? For them, it's not so clear. If the Malian farmers can produce enough to meet what the, the urban consumers need, then we don't have a problem. But if we look around the countries of West and Central Africa, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Senegal, Gambia, Ghana, becoming self-sufficient in rice production is difficult at best, and at worst, might not be the best use of scarce resources, which is here, land and water. The worldwide food crisis in 2008 actually suggested that this was exactly the case. What we saw was that there was a crisis in Asia, world prices went up, and who um, suffered from this? It was the urban consumers in many of these countries. Now suppose that we say, okay, let's let the U.S. keep its subsidies, and now we were going to propose that in developing countries, they provide subsidies to their farmers. This seems as if we might be leveling the playing field. It could be kind of a win-win situation. That might be better, but it also might not be better. If we ask the governments of Burkina Faso and Niger, which are two of the poorest countries in the world, to spend their scarce budgetary resources on subsidies, this might reduce spending in other countries, in other sectors, health, education, and roads, which might be more important for basic needs and for economic development. My point here is the following. It's just that economic development is quite complex, and we can't assume that a one-size-fits-all approach is going to help with economic development. We need to be looking at the specific context of poverty. So where does this get us? It's easy for me to say, well, it's all context specific. And I, I asked a colleague of mine how she incorporates her faith into her work. She's an economist. She said, in my view, there's really no faith-related reason to use different tools of economic analysis. Our faith may influence our choice of questions to study. And perhaps the va our values may influence the way in which we weigh the benefits and the costs. But our an analysis of the situation should still be a good economic analysis. So then you might say, well, we're talking a lot about poverty. Why do I care about analysis? And, and this brings me to my third point, which is that I think economics and economic development and maybe religion, I'm not a theologian, involves hard choices and making difficult choices. In the face of scarcity, how do you prioritize? 
And these choices have real implications. So we talked about the importance of giving power to the people. This the idea of subsidiarity when I was at Catholic Relief Services that we discussed quite often. And my question is, does, does people power always imply power to the people? I mean, I think very few of us would agree that with the fact that individuals should be able to have a voice in their community, state, religion, and country, and that voice should be heard. Yet what does people power and economic power, economic democracy, really mean? Does it mean an equal voice? Does it mean an equal decision making? Does it mean equal ownership for all? In your paper, you mentioned the fact that maybe in order to promote economic well-being of all, economic democracy must solicit the guard against the economic power in the hands of a few, which is one way that we could approach this. So in some cases, that might help us to achieve economic development, but in others, it might not. If we look at the situation of Zimbabwe, for example, for generations, large tracts of arable land were owned by a few wealthy, mainly white Zimbabweans. It was an agricultural exporter, was certain, and while it wasn't rich, it wasn't among one of the poorest countries in the world either. Was the situation fair? No, not at all. Was there inequality? Yes, huge inequalities. There were white Zimbabweans who represented less than 1% of the population, but owned more than 70% of the arable land. Was this good for development? On the surface, no. And so in, the, in 2000, Robert Mugabe, the president of the time, began to distribute land or redistribute land via a compulsory system. Was this equitable? It was definitely equitable. Was it efficient? I don't know. I wasn't there on the ground and I didn't analyze the situation. Was it good for development? Maybe in the long term. But in the short term, agricultural production has plummeted, violence has erupted, exports have declined, and then Zimbabweans have experienced hyperinflation, which makes it difficult for them to buy very basic goods. Now, you might be saying, well, this is a really extreme example. The way in which it was done wasn't right. These are only short-term effects, and there was a lot going on in Zimbabwe at the time. And you'd be exactly right. But that's also my point. My point is that these policies, these interventions, are, these principles are extremely important to have in our mind, but are also extremely context-dependent. And then we have to be aware that when we are making certain recommendations or living by certain principles, that it really needs to be dependent upon that local situation. If we think that people power is an important principle, we also have to think of its implications. Redistributing land in one context might be completely disastrous in another. Breaking up a natural monopoly, such, for example, kind of a power or electricity monopoly, might allow for smaller power companies, more competition in the share of wealth, but at the same time, it could result in certain inefficiencies and environmental destruction. Asking rich people or wealthier people within a village to share with the poor, which in my experience in most Muslim countries, people already do, it is going to redistribute the wealth within that community, but at the same time, it could affect the way in which people engage or adopt new technologies that could be beneficial for the village as a whole. I think that the principle of people power is a good one and an important one, but we also need to think about how and can how that will and can be done in practice. Which brings me to my fourth and last point. I'd like us to think globally, but learn, analyze, and act locally. So much of what we'll be, we have been talking about so far and we will be talking about has been focusing on the global economy. And to be sure, we know that our policies in the US, Europe, Japan, other places have an impact upon poverty in developing countries. The financial crisis in the US and Europe has affected terms of trade and donations to developing countries. Our immigration policies here influence doctors and nurses' choices to migrate, and our agricultural subsidies affect world markets. This is completely clear, and this needs to be in our mind. But as we talk about this idea of global markets and global economies, we cannot and should not forget that economic development is, I would argue, at heart local. Many of the economic, social, and political causes of poverty are very context-specific. And, and here I'm not blame, pacing the blame on the poor. I'm saying we need to understand the context. And so are many of the solutions. I would argue that many of the things that you've already proposed when you talked about those three elements, that of group interest, a moral economy, and shared power, are principles that many of the poor, at least in my experience in developing countries, are already living by. In many cases, these concepts are only quite new to us. They're not so new to them. And so I think that we in this room, as we're here together, can strive to understand how our economic policies can affect the poor, not only here, but also overseas. We can understand the causes of poverty in developing countries, and we can hopefully use our combined resources to complement the strengths and resources of those in developing countries. And as we do so, we should do so with empathy, as you called for. But I would also argue that we don't want necessarily our empathy to blind us to how complex poverty really is and the solutions to it. So with this in mind, I would like just to leave you with one quotation who unfortunately does not necessarily have an author, but it was written in Time magazine in 2005 
which said that pity sees suffering and wants to ease the pain, whereas passion sees injustice and wants to settle the score. P pity implores the powerful to pay attention, whereas passion warns them, warns them what will happen if they don't. The risk of pity is that it kills with kindness. The promise of passion is that it builds on the hope that the poor are fully capable of helping themselves if given the chance. The world's poor need no more condolences. They need people to get interested, get mad, and then get to work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Our second respondent this evening is uh, Joseph Kaboski, who is the David and Aaron Seng Foundation Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. He obtained his PhD from the University of Chicago in 2001 and taught previously at Ohio State University and at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on growth, development, and international economics, uh, structural transformation, trade, education, and microfinance. His current research involves a macroeconomic evaluation of large-scale microfinance programs, and his geographic areas of focus have been Thailand, Mexico, and East Africa. He has consulted for the Federal Reserve Banks of Chicago, Minneapolis, and St. Louis, as well as the World Bank, and he is a faculty research fellow of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Thank you very much, Joe, for coming from yeah. Yeah, Paul made. Um, I, I focused on five points, um, and I'm going to start by sort of uh, talking about, the, instead of kind of offering platitudes and then disagreeing at the end, I'm going to start with the, the parts that disagree and I think talk about areas where I think we have more common ground uh, toward the end. Can you hear me? Or, yeah? Is that working? Okay. We economists are not able to speak with that or outside of Jenny, without our visual things. Um, well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, Paul argues that there's a need for dialogue. And I can't speak for all economists, but for me, uh, I certainly agree. Um, without religion, we cannot answer the two big questions. What is a good life, and what is a good society? Uh, authentic religion helps answer these questions by revealing man to himself. Say markets. I agree with Paul that markets do not contain their own moral compass. Um, authentic religion helps answer these questions by revealing man to himself, our nature, our purpose, and our ultimate destination. As an example, the Pope has emphasized that human development must human development must be full or integral, and by integral, it means the whole person and the whole of society. So all aspects of society and all people and the whole person being body and soul. Um, so there's a need for uh, religion to be in this dialogue. There's also a need for economists to be in this dialogue. The theology alone cannot answer, answer moral questions, especially if the morality of decisions depend on uh, the effects, on their effects. And so there is need for authentic dialogue. And I say authentic uh, dialogue. Um, I'm not an expert in interreligious dialogue. I, I was talking with an expert, and I think I stumbled at least upon something. Um, I imagine that the first step in true dialogue is to understand the other person with whom you, you wish to dialogue. Some effort learning the basics of the other field and having a mutual respect, knowledge, and understanding of the under, other person is essential. It's a difference between true dialogue and polemics, and I think it's probably very difficult. You guys would know this uh, much more than I would. I am admittedly ignorant on many aspects of religion. And uh, likewise, I think uh, Paul's essay con conveys, um, unfortunately, little understanding of economics, economic language, and, and most importantly, what economists actually do, what we're about. And so this is what I, I mainly want to add insight on. I strongly disagree with Paul's assertion that modern economics is a religion. Indeed, I think it reflects a prejudice of discipline and that prejudice of discipline can harm true dialogue. Not all fields are like our own. That doesn't mean that other fields don't have merit. Paul references the invisible hand. Um, economists don't spend our time reading Adam Smith. It's, it's sort of a, a little secret that most economists have never read The Wealth of Nations, much less the theory of moral sentiments. 
So the invisible hand doesn't play a huge role in our thinking. Um, most of us are neither ideologues nor, nor social theorists or philosophers. Uh, we don't believe markets cure every evil, nor do we sit in our basement trying to derive systems to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. And so I think we should put these caricatures to rest. I, d I don't think they're productive for, for uh, this dialogue. Our field is highly mathematical. It needs to be to answer technical questions. This makes interdisciplinary discourse difficult. Um, but I think, especially for students, I think dialogue is important. And so I would encourage people to invest the time into learning both theology and economics. Um, I, like I said, especially the students. Um, our focus is on the technical aspects of the economy rather than the philosophical aspects. We're basically technicians. And like auto technicians, we spend most of our time looking under the hood. We're trying to figure out what makes things work and what seems to be broken. We collect and analyze data. We write down and test models. We measure and predict the impacts of policies. That's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And why do we do this? Well, it's often the technical issues rather than the ethical issues or the ethical goals that are the most troubling. For example, we can talk about a right to a living wage and a right to work. But the virtues of these things are relatively clear. There isn't an economist or a politician in the world who would ever state that low wages or high unemployment are a goal. How to achieve these goals is the real question. And you can't answer these questions without understanding the technical aspects. The road to economic hell is paved with good intentions. Technical, there's another reason that we do this, and that's that technical questions are precisely our expertise. In economies, we talk about comparative advantage. And what a horrible world it would be if we look to economists to give us our moral, goal, our, our moral principles and ask theologians to design the ways of attaining these, to design the policies to attain these goals. Um, let me, go, let me put on my social theorist cap for today, though, and quickly address Paul's three concerns. Um, again, I think these principles are pretty universal, as Paul, as Paul mentioned. The economic crisis, the environmental crisis, and, the, and global poverty and disparity. Uh, they don't require a great deal of deep research, and they are well known. I'm a University of Chicago trained economist. I don't know a single person who is pro-financial crisis, pro-global warming, or pro-poverty. But for the sake of ingraining them into the memory, we can think of them as the, the concerns of Barack Obama, Al Gore. For global poverty, I thought about putting the Pope, but I wanted to spice things up a little bit so we have Angelina Jolie. <laughs> That'll probably be the one thing you remember for what I said. <laughs> let's, go, let's look first at the global economic crisis, OK? Here I have income per capita on this axis, and this is time. And the dashed line is the beginning of the crisis, OK? And you can see a deep drop. Only this isn't the current economic crisis. That's the Great Depression, OK? Seven years after the Great Depression, we had another big financial crisis in Thailand. Okay, and I want you to notice two things. The first thing is tremendous growth leading up to the crisis. The second thing is the first two years of the crisis in East Asia looks a lot like the first two years of the Great Depression. But after that, the Great Depression is twice as bad as it was and lasts a much longer time, whereas East Asia returns to high growth. OK? Now I'm going to plot the current crisis. That's a green line. Once again, we see high growth leading up to the crisis. But the crisis itself is hardly visible, OK? Now, I'm not putting this up to poo-poo the financial crisis or ignore the suffering of people that have suffered because they've lost their retirements or they've lost their jobs in this recession. But I think we need to keep it in perspective. I think people have pounced on this recession for political advantage, first one side and now the other. And I don't think it's warranted. This crisis is, is, is real, but it's nothing compared to previous crises, especially when you think of in human terms, because we're far wealthier than Thailand 
1997 or the U.S. in 1929, where a huge drop in income is the difference between living and dying. Yes, problems exist in financial markets. I don't think anyone denies that. There are differences in opinions in how to shore things up. And I think uh, Jenny gave a, a good example that these are complicated questions. But we can't focus on the crisis only and ignore the tremendous growth. I don't think the crisis is a reason to start rethinking the foundations of the economy. Maybe a reason to spur discussion, and we might want to rethink the foundations of the economy anyway. But, but the crisis is not, is not a big deal. Um, it's not. In fact, you might, you might look. This, I'm fine to be laughed at. That's okay. You might look and you might think over the past 80 years, economists have learned something. Go back, let's go to the global environment with Al Gore. Again, economists study the technical aspects of pollution. And again, we are not ideologues. Nobody, we know that environmental concerns are real, and pollution is a clear place where there's market failure. And there's, we propose ways to get around market failure. Some of these are government ways, regulation, taxes, fines, etc. Okay, and this has clearly played a role in abating uh, and then we've come up with other things because besides being government failure, uh, market failure is also government failure. And so assigning property rights is something that economists emphasize. Another thing, and this may seem counterintuitive, but growth actually helps. Emissions for all but, but, but carbon emissions have declined in advanced economies over the past 30 years. Here, that's not, that's not just true for the United States, that's actually true for China. Let's go to the last one, uh, which is global poverty. Angelina Jolie and the suffering billions. This is what I do. I'm a, I'm a development economist, like Jenny, so this is the, the focus. I think Paul did a good, good job of describing. Poverty hurts. Most people in this world live on less than $3 a day. That's $1,000 a year. That's unimaginable to most of the people in this room. Poverty rates are falling. And growth is critical. Poverty rates, the last 30 years, we've seen more people come out of poverty because of the growth of China and India than we've seen in the history of mankind. Growth is absolutely critical for the poor. And we've learned some things about growth. Over the past 50 years, growth doesn't solve everything. And I, and I agree that inequality is a big issue. But when you look at global inequality, Global inequality is driven by differences in growth. Poor people are poor because they haven't grown. They've always been poor, okay? And even within societies, it's often, if you look in China, the poor in China are the poor on the, on the western side. The coast is getting wealthy. Parts are growing and parts aren't. So growth is critical. We've learned a lot over the past 40 years. We've witnessed some disaster economies, and they've had some commonalities. Centrally planned economies. Countries with civil, like North Korea, China pre-1978 under Mao, where millions of people would die in famines, okay? Countries in Africa, the civil war and, unrevolution, and, and revolutionary unrest. It hasn't been the people that have been trying to divide up the pie that have escaped poverty. It's mainly been the people that have grown a bigger pie. It's not to... Again, poo-poo di distributional issues, but I think it, it needs to be emphasized. There's also been miracle economies, and they've also had something in common. Namely, every miracle economy of the past, Thailand's an example, the past 40 years, has grown, has been globally financially integrated and global maturity. No, no country has been a miracle by closing themselves up. Okay? Some examples. North Korea and South Korea, my wife's Korean. You go to South Korea and you can tell the heights of people are different by their generation. The old people are short and nutrition improved and the younger generation is taller. You go to North Korea and people are, are so nutritionally deprived that they don't even reach puberty by age 16, 17. And their, stunt, their growth is stunted. China, pre-1978 and post-1978. In the late 1950s, during Mao's Great Leap Forward, tens of millions of people died. We're talking 
human catastrophe on the scale of World War II, okay? Post-1978, when China's the economic giant that's, um, you know, growing like by leaps and bounds. And that's due to a, a change in, from centralization, from a centralized economy to a market economy. Income doesn't solve everything. And I don't want to say growth solves everything, okay? Here's the United States from 1965 to almost the present. I couldn't get data beyond this, okay? Income's growing pretty rapidly. But at the same time, we see a decline in religi religiosity. There's religious membership. There's contributions as a percent of donations, okay? I was actually surprised that this wouldn't come up in a theologian's paper on the religion of economics. Maybe, maybe this reminds theologians to be careful where they throw stones because we economists don't look so bad in this picture. <laughs> Why do we see a decline in religiosity? I think that's an interesting question. Um, is the market responsible? It may play a role. Paul talks about advertising, emphasizing maybe the, the body more than the soul. And that may play a role, but I don't think it's the market system that can explain everything. It, uh, certainly if I graph this picture for Europe, this would be even starker, this drop. And if I looked at a, a socialist country, a communist country, you know, it, would be, it would be even worse. Um, so I don't think it's, 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 got, it's all the, the economy. Oh, wrong page. Um, I think looking at these countries, we can't ignore the, the history of the power of ideas, especially as academics. Um, religion has been losing in the marketplace of ideas in recent times, and not for lack of a good product. A lack of religion is more strongly correlated with education than it is with, with income. Uh, another possibility is, of course, that income gives us an illusion of independence. But, 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 but like I said, it's more strongly correlated with education. Um, so are, li are they learning this in their economics courses? Or is the onus on theologians? Perhaps this cohort of theologians has failed to provide students with anything sufficiently compelling, substantive, or well-articulated to be an alternative to atheism, materialism, secularism, or economics for that matter. So I guess that's a challenge. And we're left with these key questions. Um, you know, what it, have we gained the world but lost our souls? What is a good life? Is a good life a life of gluttony? And I think Paul emphasized these islands of opulence in these oceans of poverty. I think as people, we've lost the virtues of moderation self-control, prudence, and we pay the price. We suffer from gluttony in many ways. Obesity, shopaholism, sex addiction, environmental degradation, and even gluttony of our own autonomy, leading to abortion, divorce, never committing to marriage. We're even gluttons when we're not gluttons. We all diet, but no one fasts. One is done for vanity, and the other's for humility. So does more always lead to happiness? I think that's a good question. And what about a lack of charity, justice, and solidarity? I mean, here, I think we're all guilty. I certainly am guilty. I do research in developing countries. I know one in 10 infants die. And yet I live in relative comfort. I give my own children medicine. But there are children elsewhere who go without. It's not that we do nothing, but, but if we ask us, ourselves the, the question of, you know, what would Jesus do, uh, the answer is certainly more. I don't think charity negates the uh, importance of technical questions, though. It's, but it seems to be an essential part of a good life. To finish up, I think materialism and secularism constitute a spiritual or cultural crisis. There is a real need to re-evangelize the culture. And the big picture, this is probably the most important crisis of all. So I think we need to add a fourth concern to our list. And maybe we need to add the Pope's picture after all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. I know that this opens a whole uh, lot of questions <laughs> for discussion and for dialogue. and. Uh, you're probably frustrated that we can't go further this evening, but it's become...
quite late, so I hope you can uh, join me in thanking our panelists and our respondents for a terrific session. And I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you again next year on September 22nd for our next conference. Thank you. Thank you.